uh, and the PDF of the slides that we use. So as birders uh, or anyone that's interested in birding, uh, we pay very close attention to the changing of seasons. Uh, we mostly focus a lot on spring and fall migration uh, just because there's usually a lot of birds moving through uh, and it's a pretty exciting time. Uh, however, winter can be just as, as exciting. Uh, so hopefully you learned something new in this webinar um, and you get a little bit more excited about the changing of the seasons. Uh, so we'll get started. All right, so our, our Zoom screen that we have here that is you're probably pretty used to if you've attended any webinar in the last year. Uh, so Zoom is the platform that we use for our webinars. I'm sure most of us have used this at some point this year. Uh, but the, if it is your first time Zooming, it does take a little playing around with. So I just want to point out that your video and your microphone should be off and muted. Uh, like I said earlier, that's going to help our technology run just a little bit smoother. Also, if you didn't uh, take a shower or get your hair combed this morning, it, don't worry about having your videos on. Uh, both of these can be done if you just move your mouse to the bottom of your screen and make sure that that microphone and the camera both have red lines across them. When I went into full screen, your screen probably did as well. Uh, if you need to exit the full screen, you can push escape on your keyboard or click the exit full screen at the top. At the bottom of your window, you'll see the chat button, which I've circled here in green. Uh, that, if you click that, that should dock your, your chat window to the side of your presentation window. Uh, that way you can see and interact with folks uh, while I'm presenting. When you chat a message, uh, just make sure that you're sending that message to everyone uh, so we can all see your input or ask your questions or answer questions. Um, I try to make this as interactive as possible uh, as much as we can using the chat function. Uh, so speaking of chat, uh, let's, let's try it out. Uh, so we're going to start our way out, start out this program the same way we do for all of our programs. And that's by getting to know our participants a little bit better. So in the chat window, type where you're Zooming from, how many people are watching this webinar with you, and what bird reminds you of winter time. Since we started this webinar series back in April, uh, our reach has grown outside of Colorado. Uh, so we love just seeing where people are tuning in from and seeing how far our reach is going. All right, I see a lot of folks from Colorado tuning in, someone from Georgia, that's awesome. Yeah, chickadees definitely remind me of winter. Juncos, awesome. Uh, buffalo heads, I love buffalo heads and winter waterfowl. We'll be talking a little bit more about that uh, in this webinar. Awesome, Montana, Nebraska. So cool to see you folks outside of Colorado um, and even all throughout Colorado, it's a big, uh, it's a big state. Yeah, cardinals and geese, they definitely remind me of winter. Awesome, I'm so glad that you all know how to use this chat function. Uh, feel free just to, to type in questions you might have or answer questions uh, using this chat window. Um, I love the interaction that we can still do uh, even though we're all across the country. So you can keep filling that out, uh, where you're Zooming from, how many folks are watching with you, and then what bird reminds you of winter. All right, so a little bit about who we are as your presenters. Uh, my name is Tyler, and I'm one of the environmental educators uh, with the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. My favorite bird today uh, is actually the mountain chickadee. Uh, I saw some of you mention that chickadees were, were some of your winter birds or birds that remind you of winter. Uh, I'm right there with you. Uh, mountain chickadees are awesome. I love seeing them. They remind me of being in the mountains. Uh, but also this year, some folks definitely around here in the front range are starting to see them uh, in their backyards, uh, which is pretty interesting. Um, and they're just such cute little birds. Um, and Stacy, Stacy Monahan, she's our camps and family program coordinator. Uh, she's gonna be our chat moderator today. Uh, so she's in the chat, she's answering your questions. Uh, she'll get to any technical difficulties if you have any. Um, and her favorite bird, uh, not surprisingly, is the black cat chickadee. Um, and that was before I told her that my favorite bird today was going to be the mountain chickadee. Uh, so we're both in the, in the mindset of winter uh, and about their survival. And we'll be talking a lot uh, about chickadees uh, during this webinar and, and seeing how they actually survive these harsh winters. 
And if you notice any differences, if this is your first time seeing a black cap chickadee or a mountain chickadee, uh, look at the differences in them. They can actually, they're very similar in size, uh, but they have different calls and they have a couple of different uh, field marks that you can look at. All right, so a little bit about our organization, if this is your first webinar. Uh, so we are the Bird Conservancy of the Rockies. And our mission at the Bird Conservancy is to conserve birds and their habitats. And we do this through an integrated approach of science, education, and land stewardship. Uh, so with this three-tiered approach, uh, we really try to strategically and effect effectively uh, work towards accomplishing our mission of conserving those birds and their habitats. Our science team, they're out there advancing knowledge. Uh, they're working from Canada all the way down into Mexico. Uh, they do a lot of a lot of collecting data, banding birds, analyzing data, putting out publications. Uh, they're really just helping us advance our knowledge about birds. Our stewardship team, uh, we like to say they're the boots on the ground. They're the ones out working with private ranches, uh, trying to make sure that, they're pri that our private lands, uh, which take up definitely a lot of our grasslands, that their ranches are as bird friendly and conservation uh, minded as they can. Uh, but also make sure that we're also benefiting the ranchers as well because they definitely work hard and they deserve uh, what, they, what they earn. And then the education team, uh, which is myself and Stacy, uh, And also if you're on Facebook Live, Colin is actually moderating that one. Uh, he's our banding coordinator. Uh, our goal with the education team is just to inspire the next generation uh, or the current generation. Uh, we wanna make sure that, that folks are, are keeping their eye out and looking at nature and trying to to, to identify birds. Um, they're really amazing creatures. Uh, so we're just trying to inspire those people to get outside and to have a, a conservation mindset when it comes to nature. So what exactly are, are we gonna be learning in this webinar today? Uh, so we're gonna be learning about certain species of birds that stick around uh, in cold, harsh winter climates. Uh, we will not be able to cover all of birds that we consider winter birds, uh, but I'll try to give a good overall representation of why these bird, these specific birds uh, stick around. We'll also explore different adaptations uh, that are specific to winter survival, which surprisingly uh, isn't actually too different from how we as humans survive winter, uh, but just slightly. We will be talking about some winter birding traditions uh, that some of you may know of, and kind of go into depth about how we can get out and birding this winter. And then at the end of our webinar, uh, we like to finish it off with some bird ID. Uh, so we'll learn how to ID some, some birds that we can center, consider our winter residents. I wanted to do a webinar today uh, on winter birds because of course, uh, birds never cease to amaze me. Uh, that's why I work for a bird organization. Um, I love birds, they're so amazing, but they migrate from migration to just freezing temperatures. Birds are just highly adaptable. Uh, they can adapt to a lot of different conditions, which I find fascinating. Also growing up in Southern California and living there for a majority of my life, uh, I never really experienced true seasons. Um, so I really love experiencing what I would consider a true winter where snow actually falls uh, and the changes that come along with that. Um, I also understand that winter looks different in many different places. Uh, so I know we're all tuning in from different, different locations. Uh, if you're in Southern California, you probably think of winter as wearing shorts and it being sunny. Uh, so some of these birds won't necessarily apply uh, to those warmer Southern locations. Uh, however, I think it's just really interesting to kind of know how these birds uh, are able to survive in, in really cold, snowy parts of our country. All right, so we, we always add this slide just because I like to, to teach people about, about why, why birds? Why are we here uh, learning about birds? Why did it, do we have an organization where we're trying to conserve birds? For one, they're so accessible. Uh, no matter where a person lives or what time of the year it is, if you go out, you will find a bird. Um, I don't think a day goes by that I don't see a bird, um, even through my windows in my backyard. Uh, so they're extremely accessible, which is, which is so great. Birds are also environmental indicators. Uh, so they're gonna be one of the first groups of, of animals that are gonna be affected by environmental change. Uh, we're currently seeing this with our major wildfires we've had in the West, 
uh, we're seeing a lot of birds dying off maybe from those fires or maybe from, from early, early snows. Uh, so they, they can tell us a lot about, uh, about how our environment is changing. We also consider them ecosystem services. Uh, so birds provide us with pest control. Uh, they help spread seeds uh, so we can get beautiful trees and wildflowers in the spring. Uh, so they're an amazing ecosystem service as well. And lastly, they're just, they're inspirational. Uh, from watching them fly uh, to, to doing artwork about them or, or flying in planes. Uh, birds have inspired us for ages. Um, and I think that's why they're, they're just such fascinating creatures. All right, so we will be moving away from migration, but I do want to mention it um, and remind everyone why birds migrate in general. Uh, that way we can further understand why, why some birds don't migrate or only migrate short distances. So migration is seasonal, it's predictable, and it's repeated each year by certain species. Migration occurs when its costs, which are very high, especially in terms of both energy and mortality risk, uh, are lower than the benefits of using well-separated breeding and wintering grounds. So whenever I teach about migration, which is basically every time I teach about birds, uh, I always ask this question about why do birds migrate? And that could be from people of all ages. I usually get around the same answer. I usually get uh, that birds migrate because it just gets too cold for them in winter. It's too cold, they can't survive the snow, uh, and that's why they move to, to warmer locations. Uh, but that's not entirely true, as many of us might know, uh, which we'll be unpacking a little bit more in detail today. So if it isn't the cold that necessarily drives birds to migrate, type into the chat, why do you think birds migrate? If they're not being cold, if they're not affected by the cold, uh, why, why then do birds wanna migrate? Awesome, y'all are, are great at using this chat function. Food and warmth uh, for breeding. Yeah, I see lots of food sources coming in. Awesome, y'all are experts, it's flying in. Lots of food. Um, which is interesting because we're going to be talking about, about these food sources as well. Um, so birds mostly migrate uh, because of their food source. They need, a, they need to move areas in order to, to stay fed and keep that energy up. Um, of course, migration, uh, it can be a lot more complicated than just eating food. Uh, but simply, that is kind of the most important reason uh, is they need to move for their, mo their food source. If you want to learn more about migration, uh, we did a couple webinars back in the fall uh, about our two-part series on migration, uh, and those are on our YouTube channel. Uh, but again, not all birds migrate north to south. We like to think of it as a north-south uh, progression or a south to north. Um, some birds that we'll be talking about today, uh, they're considered altitudinal migrants, uh, where they actually spend their springs and summers up at high elevations, and then they winter down in lower elevations. Uh, also, birds migrate a lot their, their direction of migration is also affected by, by large mountain ranges as well. So even though we like to say birds migrate north to south, uh, that's not entirely true. Uh, some of them move more east or move, move more west. Uh, so I just wanted to put that little plug in your mind. All right, so now that we understand more about why birds would migrate, uh, we're gonna fly right into what we consider uh, to be our snowbirds uh, and why they don't get to travel to some of these tropical destinations uh, like some of their other furry or feathery friends. So in a quick overview, uh, what birds do we consider to be winter birds? Uh, a lot of you answered this already in the chat. Uh, so what birds do we consider to be winter birds? Like most of you mentioned, cardinals. Cardinals definitely remind us, especially if you live on the East Coast, uh, cardinals remind us of a winter bird. Uh, and most corvids as well, like blue jays and crows. A lot of waterfowl species, uh, such as geese and ducks, they like to survive uh, in these winter locations. But also small passerines or small songbirds that, that are, we might think are, can be really hard to survive these harsh winters. Uh, we can actually uh, consider these winter birds as well. Uh, and also woodpeckers. Um, woodpeckers are, are really interesting and we'll, we'll talk a little bit more uh, about that in the coming slides. So in a nutshell, uh, birds that don't survive on just insects, uh, but can eat a variety of food like seeds, 
uh, or dormant insects are birds we consider to be winter birds. Uh, like I said earlier, we won't have enough time to talk in depth about all of the birds that we consider winter birds, uh, but we will try to cover as much as we possibly can uh, in the time that we have allotted. All right, so type into the chat uh, if anyone can identify this bird. We'll just start off with, with a quick little bird ID uh, with some of the beautiful snow falling. Uh, can anybody identify this bird that we have on the screen? All right, we, we have that it's a sparrow. Awesome. Maybe a pine sis, LBB, yep, little brown bird. So this bird, um, I just wanted to, to bring this one up quickly. Uh, is this bird is a white-throated sparrow. So good job for the, the folks that got that. Um, and again, sparrows are little brown birds. They can be really hard. Uh, but what I wanted to bring up um, is whenever I put up a picture of a bird, uh, feel free to type in your answers and try to identify them, because I know a lot of us are, are here to learn about bird identification uh, as well as other facts. But Another thing I want to bring up is winter birds, they have to solve multiple problems simultaneously. Uh, so think about being a bird and think about being kind of in, in the depths of winter. What two problems do you think you need to solve in order to survive? Feel free to type that into the chat window. What two problems do you think you need to survive uh, that, that you need to do in order to survive? So I see food and shelter and cold. Yeah, water availability, warmth, food and shelter. Yeah, good job. So what birds really need to focus on is they need to focus on, for one, being warm, but also they're not gonna be warm without food. So birds need to focus on staying warm and also finding food. Uh, in the following slides, we're gonna be learning, uh, our learning is gonna be based on, on the size of birds and not technically their families. Uh, a lot of the webinars we've done in the past, we focus on certain family groups uh, and taxonomic orders. I'm gonna throw all that out the window today. Uh, I've organized my, my presentation on just the size of birds. Uh, so we'll be focusing on small birds, medium size, uh, and also large birds and how, what they do in order to accomplish staying warm and finding food. Uh, like I said earlier, there's gonna be a lot of pictures of birds. So feel free to, to use that chat function and interact with us. Uh, and identify them if you know them. Uh, if you don't, that's okay too. We love guesses. Uh, if you're thinking and you're guessing, I always like to say, then you're learning, you're using your brain. All right, so we're gonna start with how, what we consider smaller birds, uh, how they survive. So for what we are considering our little birds today, uh, we'll be focusing on kinglets, chickadees, and a little bit about sparrows. Uh, specifically, we'll be talking about the one on the top, which is this beautiful golden crown kinglet. Uh, we'll be talking a little bit about black cat chickadees and then our white crown sparrows, uh, which is actually one of my favorite sparrows that we have. I would also consider finches to be small birds and red poles uh, to be little birds as well. Uh, but for the sake of time, uh, we're, we're not gonna really recognize those species today, uh, but a lot of what we're talking about will apply to them. So just like with migration, a bird's focus in winter is maintaining their energy. Birds need food as fuel for migration, but also for staying warm. Uh, so unlike migrating birds, they need this energy, not so much for flight, uh, just for body warmth. So how do these small birds get that energy? A bird's internal body temperature uh, needs it to be around 105 degrees Fahrenheit uh, in order to stay, stay really active. Uh, to keep this internal temperature, birds need to find food uh, to gain that energy. And just when birds need the most food for survival, uh, food becomes a little scarce in winter. When food does become scarce and they cannot find that energy, uh, they also have other, other adaptations that help them survive. They can also drop their core temperature lower than 105 degrees uh, during the night and it'll help them conserve enough energy and they will actually go into a state of controlled hypothermia. Uh, so they'll bring their body temperature down, they'll try to save their energy, and they'll go into what we call a controlled hypothermia that they're able to, to get out of. 
Some birds will seek shelter inside trees, while others will also huddle together in the nighttime. Chickadees spend most of their time in winter in flocks, uh, and these flocks will help find food. Uh, they can find shelter together. Uh, if you ever observe chickadees in the winter, they're usually not alone. Uh, they're usually hanging out with some of their friends. Uh, so they like to remain in flocks. Um, but it's also been observed that kinglets are a little tiny kinglet, which weighs like the size of a nickel. Uh, they're really, really small birds. Uh, they actually do not shelter uh, in tree cavities like, like chickadees. Um, but instead, they will actually huddle together with their heads facing in, and that'll help them maintain some warmth during the night. So you might be thinking, uh, why don't they just use a, a cavity? There's so many you know, nest cavities around that could be used. Uh, kinglets, they, they don't use them. They, they will actually just huddle together from what's been observed uh, so far. They'll be huddled together to keep that warmth in together to keep their body warmth. So we understand probably that all of the feathers that these birds have help them stay warm. Uh, feathers are nice and warm, it, it keeps them warm. But if we look at these birds, uh, you might be thinking, how do their legs and their feet not freeze? Um, I'm sure some of us have seen birds like on ice or in the snow, uh, and it looks like their legs aren't affected at all. So yes, their feet do get cold. Uh, they do get cold feet. Um, they can actually drop the temperature of their legs and their feet down to near freezing. Uh, so their temperatures can be around 30 degrees for their legs and their feet, uh, which if that happened to our feet, uh, they'd be frostbitten and frozen. Uh, if you ever walked outside in winter without shoes on, uh, we don't last very long walking on ice uh, without socks or shoes on. But since chickadees feet, they don't actually freeze and they remain that temperature uh, of not fully freezing um, all winter, it actually, it doesn't really affect them. The goal for these small birds and these chickadees uh, is to keep their body warm. Uh, so they will only send warmth uh, through blood vessels and to, to the extremities, uh, just from keeping them from freezing or from keeping them from being damaged, uh, but they won't keep them up to the core temperature of their, their bodies. And the reason why they, they just can't retain that same warmth in their feet uh, as their body is because they would be admitting way too much energy uh, and they wouldn't be able to restore that energy. So if they try to keep their whole body, their feet, uh, their body, if they try to keep that warm all, all night long, uh, they'd be expelling too much energy and they actually wouldn't be able to survive. A little bit about white crowned sparrows. I talked about this earlier uh, during migration, but we consider some of their subspecies to be altitudinal migrants. Uh, so out here in Colorado, we have a subspecies uh, that spends their summer and their spring up in high elevations, up near 10,000 to, to 14,000 feet. Uh, and that's where they breed. Uh, and then once the temperatures start dropping in fall, uh, they will actually migrate down to lower elevations. Um, so we can't always think about migration being north to south or south to north. Uh, it could also be from west to east or east to west. Um, since birds that, that stick out winter, they don't just eat one food source, uh, what can they eat? So type into the chat, what do you think birds eat uh, if they're not so much catching flying insects around? So what are these birds eating if they're not eating insects? Yeah, some definitely eating from our, our feeders, conifer tips, bird seed and grains, maybe pine cones, awesome. So chickadees uh, and other small birds, they will basically eat whatever they can find during the winter. Uh, anything goes as long as it'll fit in their mouth, uh, except for kinglets. Uh, so like that golden crown kinglet we talked about earlier, they are almost exclusively, they almost only exclusively eat insects. Um, they have small, tiny beaks that are pretty thin. Uh, so they're not adapted to actually be eating seeds or cones or anything like that. But you might be thinking, but Tyler, you said earlier that birds migrate to find food, that they need to eat. And if you're an insect eater, you probably migrate uh, down to the tropics, down to, to warmer locations to find their food. Uh, why don't kinglins do that? And that's because uh, there are still insects around. Uh, we might not see them flying around like we do in the summertime, uh, but there are insects around. So we might not see them out and about in the cold, uh, but that doesn't mean they're not around. They're actually trying to their own uh, version of survival. So they're using their own techniques. So these invertebrates or insects, uh, they can still be found in the ground or inside bark. 
uh, and even underwater, like our, our American Dipper will find those invertebrates in the water. Um, even caterpillars have been known to be frozen to leaves uh, or to branches, and that provides a tasty meal for these birds. Like some of you mentioned, bird feeders, uh, they are great to have in winter. Uh, it is definitely, I know if I was a bird, I'd be really, really stoked to see a, a feeder in the backyard because winter survival is hard. Uh, so if you do have a feeder in your backyard and you're feeding birds, uh, be sure to try to keep it stocked. Uh, and if you do, you'll definitely be able to view birds in your backyard all winter long. Um, another thing I'd like to mention is if you do a bird bath, uh, you can actually get a really small water heater and you can keep your bird bath from freezing in the winter. And that's gonna provide some water, which is much needed uh, for birds. And if you have bird feeders as well as a, a water heater, you will definitely uh, be seeing birds in your backyard. All right, so we're gonna move away from our little birds, uh, our smaller birds, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about what do medium-sized birds do? Uh, so for our medium-sized birds, we're gonna be focusing on woodpeckers uh, as well as certain species of our jays. For both groups, uh, these birds are, are pretty strictly non-migratory. Uh, woodpeckers and jays will stick around the same area all year long, which you've probably observed uh, in your backyards. Woodpeckers specifically uh, are highly adapted to survive in a variety of environments. Uh, they have their long drill bit bills uh, and they're also able to cling to trees. So both of these adaptations allow them to survive off of wood boring insects or larva uh, or even ants. And their beaks actually allow them to do something during winter that other species uh, have not been observed doing. So you might be thinking that woodpeckers, you know, they make their nest cavities. A lot of other birds uh, will use those cavities as well. Uh, but during the winter, woodpeckers can actually build their own shelters uh, to overnight in. Uh, we call these uh, roosting cavities. Uh, and this is actually something that we think is an evolutionary outgrowth uh, from making their nesting cavities in spring. However, these uh, roosting cavities are, are quite different than their nesting cavities. Nesting cavities are constructed usually in a solid snag. Uh, and by snag, I mean a, a dead piece of wood uh, that's a, a part of a tree uh, that's a little easier to, to drill into. Um, they, for their nesting cavities, they want that to be a little bit more uh, solid. Um, compared to the roosting cavities. Their roosting cavities are usually built uh, in a rotting snag or something that's a little bit more soft. Um, if you've ever walked around the woods in the winter time uh, and you actually look towards the ground, you might see a lot of little uh, wood chips on the ground. Uh, and if you look around, you might be able to see that that came from, from one of our woodpeckers building their, their roosting cavities. Another thing, another difference about their roosting cavities compared to their nesting cavities uh, is they're usually a lot lower on a tree. Uh, you can usually find these roosting cavities around six feet uh, from the ground, which is much lower than a nesting cavity, which is usually a higher, higher up. Uh, so type in the chat, why do you think they would have a roosting cavity lower in a tree versus having a nesting cavity higher up in a tree? Why would they, why would they wanna do that? Maybe heat. So why would a woodpecker uh, choose to put their roosting cavity in the winter lower down and then have their nesting cavities higher up? Yeah, maybe they're not as worried about predators, might be warmer closer to the ground. Uh, yeah, their nesting cavities are probably higher up to keep away from predators. Um, they also probably can put their uh, roosting cavities lower down uh, because they're really only in there at night when they're roosting. Um, they're not in there during the day, uh, where in their nesting cavities, um, usually one, either the male or the female, uh, they usually switch off or keeping the eggs warm uh, during the day. Uh, so they probably want their, their nesting cavities a little bit higher uh, to, to like, like you all said, to keep away from predators. Uh, woodpeckers have also, they've been observed uh, returning to their roosting dens. Uh, so they don't make a bunch of them during the year. Uh, they will return every night, um, and they've even actually been observed using the same uh, roosting cavity all winter. Uh, it's also been observed, uh, even though these birds are, are solitary, they're usually on their own during the winter, uh, 
it has been observed having a downy and uh, a hairy woodpecker in the same roosting cavity uh, come out at the same time. Um, so maybe they're just buddies and they wanted to hang out during the winter and stay warm, a little more warm. So unlike our kinglet and chickadee friends, uh, the woodpeckers, like I said, they don't really stay in a group for warmth. Uh, they have plenty to eat, so they're not too much. They're not worried about keeping up their energy. They have plenty to eat, um, and they also have a warm place to shelter in overnight. Uh, so they don't necessarily need to rely on others to sur for survival. Uh, you won't see them in big flocks like you would with chickadees. Another amazing fact uh, about woodpeckers, which I just actually found out, uh, is woodpeckers actually don't have any down feathers. Uh, so you might be thinking for for winter, these birds have these down feathers. It helps them keep warm. Uh, but woodpeckers actually only have what we call our true feathers. Uh, they're not the soft, soft down feathers, um, which I think is really interesting. And I, I need to do a little bit more research on that as well. Uh, so if you want to learn a little bit more about that, uh, you can join me in doing a little bit more research about exactly why they don't have down feathers. I wasn't able to, to look that up. All right, we're going to get into our J family now. Uh, you may be familiar with jays and just corvids in general. Um, they're extremely intelligent. Uh, so with jays, I'm mostly going to be talking about Canada jays, uh, just because they're such an amazing winter survivalist. Uh, but a lot of what I'm going to be saying about Canada jays, you can actually apply to your scrub jays or blue jays, uh, or even the stellar jay. So in late summer and early fall, Canada jays, they start hiding little caches of food. Uh, that help get them through winter. Canada jays are just, uh, I definitely think of them as the ultimate winter survival bird. They're always up in the forest. They stick there all year long. Um, while chickadees and other small birds, uh, they have to constantly find food. They're always on the lookout for food to keep up their energy. Uh, Canada, Canada jays just kind of leisurely stroll through the winter, uh, grabbing snacks out of their pantry uh, that they stash all throughout. Uh, and in these pantries, uh, scientists have found mushrooms and berries. Uh, they found nuts uh, and even some meat like venison. Uh, that sounds like a pretty yummy trail mix to me. <laughs> I'll, I'll eat that in a, a little mix. So the Corvid family or the Corvidae family, uh, they've evolved over, over years to have an amazing cognitive recall ability. Uh, jays in Canada, jays, they can actually hide up to a thousand little food packages every day. And this can actually end up being around 100,000 little caches that they stash within a season. They're able to remember where, where they stash each of these, these food packages uh, in their nesting territory, which is pretty amazing. They can remember where each little package is and their nesting territory can be as big as 250 football fields of really dense forest. So it's a huge area that they're just stashing these little, uh, these little caches at, which it's just mind boggling to me. Uh, the, I wish I had cognitive recall like jays or hummingbirds. Because they're, they're able to re, uh, maintain such a high energy source, uh, they're, they're always stocked with food. They have a lot of energy. Um, it allows Canada jays to actually begin nesting much earlier uh, than our other passerines. Uh, so Canada jays will actually begin nesting in late winter uh, when other birds are still just trying to survive. Um, it's actually being studied uh, that this nesting behavior also allows their young to be fledged early. Uh, so since they nest earlier, that means they're going to have young that's hatched earlier. And if they're fledged by May, uh, they'll have enough time to learn these cognitive skills uh, and begin caching food of their own for the coming season. Uh, so it's an adaptation that these, these jays have, have done with their nesting, which is pretty cool. However, of course, uh, the northern areas, they are warming. Uh, they're warming kind of at alarming rates, actually. Uh, and this warming in these northern areas, uh, it is actually affecting these food caches. Uh, like we talked about earlier, birds are seen as environmental indicators. And we are actually currently seeing this with our Canada jays and the warming winters. Unlike nut hatches, uh, who store, they store seeds, Canada jays store perishable food. Uh, that can actually rot, like I was talking about venison. Um, if, it's like if you leave the freezer open all day and you have meat in that freezer, uh, it's going to rot. It's not going to be good to eat anymore. Um, so there's a lot of studies going on, going on with this. So it will be interesting to see uh, how they adapt to the warming planet 
uh, again, birds have been around for, for millions of years, and it'll be interesting if, we, if we'll be able to see this adaptation uh, as our planet warms. The corvid family, they're just so intelligent uh, that winter is just a breeze for them. Uh, they can eat so many different types of food, and I'm sure if you've ever gone to a campground or you've gone up uh, snowboarding or skiing in the winter, uh, these jays will come right up to you and try to get a little bit of your snack as well. All right, so we're gonna move on to our larger birds. Uh, so for our large birds, I'll be talking about crows and ravens uh, and also about geese and then briefly just about grouse. So as you may already know, crows and ravens, uh, they're in the, cor the Corvidae family as well with the jays uh, that we just talked about. However, I wanted to split them uh, based on size because they do exhibit uh, a different behavior in winter compared to our jays. So crows will actually gather in groups of up to thousands uh, to roost together as a community uh, during long winter nights. These roosts, roosts often occur uh, in urban areas and are usually consistent each year. Uh, so type into the chat if you've ever uh, observed this phenomenon of, of a lot of a murder of crows. Have you ever seen this in your neighborhood? Um, I know I've seen it in my neighborhood, specifically having large amount of crows flying in uh, in an area. So I see that a lot of people have observed this phenomenon before. It's pretty, pretty cool to see. Um, so we call that a, com a communal roost. Um, and unlike how chickadees and kinglets use groups to survive, crows actually use these communal roosts for a variety of reasons. Uh, one reason is that it serves as an information center uh, where they can share their knowledge <laughs> of food locations. Sorry, my dogs are, are, are barking. Uh, they saw another dog outside, uh, but we'll keep going. All right, uh, so they actually use this as an information center. Uh, so they're actually sharing knowledge of different food locations. Um, this is probably unintentional. Uh, as ones, the ones that don't know where, where these food locations are, they're probably just following each other, uh, but it is still a community and they help each other as well. So being in a large group uh, also helps keep predators away. Uh, I'm sure if you've ever seen a large group of, of crows up in a tree, uh, you probably wouldn't want to go near them um, and other predators don't as well. So ravens actually have a, a little slightly, uh, they have a different habitat. Um, ravens can survive up in higher Arctic regions um, and they also begin nesting early like our Canada, Canada jays, um, usually nesting around February. So their large size, the large size of ravens, they can be huge. Um, this actually allows them to have a slower rate of heat loss uh, compared to the smaller passerines. Ravens are also, they're really opportunistic when it comes to feeding. They will kill just about anything they can, uh, but they also rely on scavenging of larger animals um, that may have been killed by another species. Uh, so they'll actually follow around, follow around wolves or human hunters uh, and whatever they kill, they'll, they'll go in and try to get a piece of it their own. Um, you may have seen it on a nature documentary before, uh, a wolf getting an animal and then ravens all around uh, trying to get a little piece for themselves as well. Uh, in winter, uh, the ravens will actually help share the discovery of these large kills within their community. Uh, during the breeding season, however, they will not share this information. Uh, so during the winter, they have that mindset of surviving, uh, so they actually won't share that information with others, uh, or they will during the winter, but during you know, when spring, when they're beginning to breed, uh, they won't actually share the information. They'll be a lot more territorial uh, of the ki kills that they, they find. So many of us in the chat box, we've been talking about how birds need to stay warm uh, and that their feathers help keep them warm. Uh, big birds such as geese and grouse, uh, they do kind of what we do when it comes to winter. Uh, they get to put on their fancy, uh, Patagonia down jackets, uh, so to say, to keep them warm. Uh, these birds will actually grow an extra set of warm insulating down feathers uh, that help keep them warm throughout the winter. Uh, and as the weather warms up, they'll molt those, those feathers uh, into their, their summer coats. You may also have observed uh, waterfowl or other passerines that, that might that look bigger in winter. They look more puffed up. Um, and that's because when a, a bird puffs out their feathers, they're actually able to trap warm, warm heat uh, inside their feathers to help keep them warm as well. So I'm gonna just touch briefly on grouse behavior 
Uh, I'm not going to go too in depth about it just because our webinar next month uh, will be all about grouse biology and I don't want to give away too much. So this is just a little taster. Um, so grouse, they have a large crop uh, where they will actually can fill an abundance of, of food in. And they, they also eat and they survive off leaf buds uh, of deciduous trees. Uh, so grouse, they're not too worried about, about their food source. Uh, they go up into the, these deciduous trees uh, and they're able to store a lot of that in their crop each day. Uh, so they're not so much worried about food. Uh, they're more worried about being prey for larger animals. Uh, so grouse, like this rough grouse we have here, uh, will actually spend a lot of their winter underneath the snow. So they will actually bury themselves in soft snow, uh, not just to stay insulated overnight, uh, but also to, to stay safe during the day. Um, so unlike ptarmigan, uh, these grouse, they, they don't molt into a, a winter plumage. Uh, if you've ever observed grouse in winter, they have their, their white winter coat and then their brown summer coat that helps them camouflage. Uh, grouse and rough grouse, uh, they do not have that adaptation. Uh, so they, they rely on these dens uh, underneath the snow, the snow to help keep them uh, hidden. And these larger birds are able to do that um, because even if the, the ice kind of crusts over when they're under it, uh, they're large and dense enough in order to get out. Uh, chickadees and other small birds, they aren't able to, to bury themselves in snow uh, because if it did ice over, uh, they're too small in order to make their way out. All right, I know that was a lot of information. Uh, I feel like I've been talking for days um, and we will get to our, our, our ID quiz really soon. Uh, but there's just so much about winter survival that I think is, is really amazing. Um, and that's kind of just an, a quick overview about it. Uh, there's still much to learn and we are still learning, uh, especially with the changing climates. Um, so I'm just gonna break it up really quickly of a summary of pros uh, and cons. So for pros, uh, since these birds don't leave or they don't go very far from their breeding grounds, uh, they'll, they can actually maintain that territory uh, come spring when migrants start arriving. Uh, so they've established it, they don't leave it, um, it's their territory. Uh, so that's, that's a pro for them. They also don't have to migrate long distances. Migration is so extremely difficult. Um, there are so many hazards flying thousands of miles um, and a lot of hatchier birds, a lot of young birds uh, they don't even survive their first year of migration because it's such a taxing thing. Um, so you can think of it uh, probably as a pro and a con. Uh, the pro is they don't have to migrate. They're not going down to a tropical destination for their vacation. Uh, they're just going to stick around and spend all year in their one breeding territory. Also, since these birds stay, stay in their territories year round, uh, they probably understand them a little bit better and they, they know where, the, where they can find the good food and the good nesting sites. Uh, because they spend their whole their whole year, they can see the changes and they know where the good stuff is. Um, especially the birds that have the adaptation of caching their food, like jays, so, so to say, um, they would not have that adaptation if they didn't stick around all year. Um, they would just migrate and find their food source instead of caching it. Uh, so that amazing adaptation actually comes because they stick around all year. And some cons, uh, as you can probably understand winter is cold. It is cold for birds, um, but nighttime is really crunch time for winter survival. Uh, in these high Arctic zones or these winter areas, um, there's more darkness than there, are, than there is daytime. Uh, so they do spend most of their days searching for food and they're constantly storing and replacing that energy while they're looking for food uh, in the daytime. So it's pretty easy for them to keep their core temperature up. Uh, but since daylight is so short in these areas, um, those cold nights can be really taxing. Uh, and some birds aren't actually able to survive it. So it is hard even compared to, to migration. There's also just, there's no food guarantee. Um, they might not be able to find their food source from year to year. Uh, each year can be different in these Arctic areas. Some years are snowier, some years are warmer. Um, so there's just not that food guarantee. All right, so we're gonna kind of start wrapping things up a little bit. Uh, so I wanted to talk quickly about winter birding traditions. Uh, so there's some, some traditions that I want to talk about uh, that I'm sure some of you have heard of uh, or maybe heard it mentioned. So the Christmas bird count uh, or the CBC as we call it, it's been running for 121 years. Uh, and the CBC, it runs every year 
from December 14th uh, to January 5th. And this happens across the country. Uh, the count happens on a one day period within that time period uh, in a 15 mile radius from a center point. Typically, there's a main compiler uh, that builds a team of birders uh, to complete the count in different sections of this large radius. Uh, the goal of the, the Christmas bird count, it's to count every bird that you see or hear within that 15 mile radius uh, within a 24 hour period. The compiler then will compile all of that data that we get and it's all put into a database uh, that Audubon controls uh, and anyone can actually can find this data. Um, it's open to the public uh, and you can compare the, a year to a different year. Uh, it's pretty, pretty cool to look at. Uh, and this data was also, it was, it was used in the 3 billion birds lost publication. Um, they went into the Christmas bird count data to help them find out how much, uh, how many birds we've lost uh, since 1970. So Christmas bird counts, if you've ever done one, uh, it's a great way to get out and, ex and get experience with really experienced local birders uh, and just nerd out birding for like eight to 10 hours. Um, of course, this year will be a lot different uh, with our COVID restrictions. Um, and some counts actually won't actually be happening this year. Um, I'm actually the compiler for our Bar Lake count uh, and we will be running our CBC, but in very limited and very small groups. Um, it won't be like years past, uh, but we do want to make sure we still get a count. Uh, that way we can compare this data uh, to come. Um, but Audubon has uh, encouraged people to cancel. Uh, there is a huge data set already. It won't affect the data that much. Um, but you can look on the CBC website and you can find out if there are counts happening toward in your area. Uh, and if you do feel comfortable and you're allowed to, uh, to join a group and, and help count birds for a day. Um, it's really fun. Uh, another great way to contribute to science uh, and learn more about winter birds uh, is participating in the Great Backyard Bird Count. Uh, the Great Backyard Bird Count is a tradition that's been happening for, for 24 years. Uh, and it's usually around the third weekend of February. Uh, for this count, all you need to do is log the birds that you see uh, during those days, uh, usually like four, February 14th to the 17th, um, into eBird. Uh, and if you log it into eBird, uh, Cornell sponsors this, so it automatically goes into their great backyard bird count data set. Um, and you can do this in your backyard. Uh, you can literally do a 10 minute birding checklist on eBird and that'll contribute to the data. Uh, or you can have a full birding day and go to multiple locations and add to that as well. It's been interesting. Uh, with the bird count and with the great backyard bird count, um, we've had higher participants each year, which is really cool to see. Uh, I'll also include these links in our follow-up e email. All right, we're running out of time. Uh, so we're gonna jump into some, some bird ID quiz. Uh, so if you have a field guide handy, feel free to grab that or an app on your phone. Um, if you are just learning how, how to identify birds, you're just getting into it, uh, that's okay. Try your best to, I, to identify or even just to describe them. Uh, again, these are pictures of birds, so size comparison is going to be, be a little hard, um, and we don't have video or sound. Uh, and if you know the bird right away, um, take a couple of breaths and see if some other folks can help uh, identify that one uh, before you do. Um, but also, as birders, I feel like the better we get, we tend to jump to conclusions uh, and it's good to try not to do that, but also with uh, these bird ID quizzes, it's a lot harder online, uh, but also could be easier because the birds aren't flying away. Um, so we'll get started with our first bird uh, and feel free to type those answers into the chat. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about each species. So here is uh, one of probably our classic birds that we think of in winter. Um, but don't jump to conclusions with this one. I'll, I'll give that little hint. Uh, so this bird can be seen uh, all around North America. They usually are flying in large flocks. Um, they go to, to areas with, with uh, water. Uh, I, I see some, I, I like this. We got a, a debate going on with the Canada versus cackling. Um, am I trying to trick you? Am I not? We will find out. Uh, Thank you so much for entering. I love just I love when people are trying trying their best uh, to identify. And also, if you just know the family, feel free to type that in as well. Uh, that's how we learn as birders. 
So I'm gonna put up uh, this next picture and that might help narrow down our answers. Uh, so the bird on the left uh, is the, the species that I showed in the one uh, previous. Uh, so that is actually going to be our cackling goose. Um, and you can really see in this picture, the size comparison. They look so similar. Um, and especially when they're not together, it can be kind of hard um, to look at these differences, but the cackling goose uh, is a lot smaller than the Canada. Um, it has yeah, that, that, that little necklace around it. Their bills are, are a lot shorter. Uh, so when you see them, um, really look at those fine details especially because they're usually going to be in a big old mixed flock uh, with Canada geese as well. And if you did say Canada goose, uh, don't worry because they were considered the same species uh, or a subspecies uh, until July 2004. Um, so they were considered at one point to be both Canada jays, uh, but this one, uh, it was a cackling goose. So good job to the folks uh, that were able to enter that. Here's our next one, I wanted to focus a little bit on waterfowl just because I love waterfowl, uh, especially in winter. Uh, so this is one for size comparison. This is one of our smallest ducks that we have in North America. And this duck will, it spends their summer high, high in the high altitudes, uh, high latitudes uh, in the Arctic. Um, and then they winter down in the lower 48. Um, and they can be there's two ducks that, that look pretty similar um, to this one. Um, and these can also be seen year round uh, in parts of the Rockies. Um, but for the most part, they, they spend their summers up in the high Canada, high provinces, uh, and then they make their way, migrate south uh, to the lower 48 for winter. Uh, a great field mark that I like to look at for this one is this, that white crescent shape uh, in front of their wing there. Uh, that's a really good field mark uh, for this one. And it looks like LED has gotten it. Uh, this is our green wing teal. Uh, they're our smallest ducks. Um, and a lot with waterfowl, you usually have those mixed, mixed flocks. So uh, they can be really fun to try to identify and, and point out. All right, here's our bonus round. Uh, feel free to just type in the number and the species you think it is. Uh, if you wanna try to get them all, Feel free to do that as well. Uh, these are kind of the other birds that I really consider to be winter birds uh, that I wasn't able to include in the, the previous slides. Um, so take your time, try to identify them. You can just put the number to the species uh, that you think. Uh, feel free to rapid fire them if you know any of them um, or save it up and try to get them all at once. And we'll talk a little bit more about each species uh, before we wrap up. I can feel the wheels turning from my computer screen. Uh, feel free to get the ones that you know out of the way. Uh, look at your field guides for some of the harder ones you might see on here. We're getting the Blue Jays, Jana, or Jana, sorry. Good job on, on number three. That one can be really tricky. I threw number six in there for folks that are tuning in from the East Coast. Awesome, Michelle, you're doing great. You must be an experienced birder. All right, and for the sake of time, I'll let you keep filling that out and I'll put up the answers. So number one, that is a common red pole. Uh, and this is in the Finch family. Um, and this one spends most of its year up in the high, high Arctic. Uh, but if you're lucky, you can actually see them down in Colorado some years, um, if you're lucky. Number two is our little brown bird, or as we call the American tree sparrow. Uh, the American tree sparrow spend their summer up in the high Arctic, uh, and then they winter down in the lower 48 uh, from Canada down into the northern end of Texas. Um, so that's our American tree sparrow. Number three is our Cassin's finch. Uh, if you said house finch, give yourself a pat on the back. The house finch, purple finch, Cassin's finch, uh, they all look really similar. Uh, but for the Cassin's finch, uh, they have a, a pointier bill. So you can see their bill is a little bit more pointy compared to a house finch. Uh, and they're actually, they have a slightly longer tail compared to the purple finch. Um, 
but again, they can be extremely difficult to identify those three finches uh, unless you get a really good look at them. Number four is our snow goose. Uh, these only are, they're, they're locally common in key wintering areas. Um, if you ever see a flock of like 10,000 Canada geese, give it a good hard look. Uh, I'm sure you can probably found, find if you're in the area, a snow goose um, inside that, that big flock of Canada geese. Five is our classic blue jay, um, which they don't really go west of our Rocky Mountains. Um, so some of you might not know them. I know I didn't see a blue jay for a long time, uh, but I, I really like, like watching them. They're, they're great birds. And for our East Coasters, I threw in the tufted titmouse. Uh, they're in the East Coast year round. Um, they're not even in our Western field guides because they're such an Eastern bird. Uh, but when I think of the East in winter, uh, at bird feeders, I definitely always think about the cute little tufted titmouse. All right, that was so much information. Uh, I know hopefully I got some folks excited about winter. Um, I just wanna leave it on. You can find birds year round, just about everywhere you go. Uh, don't let the cold keep you in, especially during these hard times being in a pandemic. Um, if you can get outside, even if it's in your backyard, uh, bundle up. There's nothing like having freezing cold hands, holding binoculars uh, while they fog up from your cold breath, uh, trying to identify a little brown bird in the distance. Um, as birders, we thrive on the challenge of identifying new and unusual birds. Uh, so you never know what winter will bring. So thank you so much for attending this webinar. Uh, they're so much fun to make, but they do take a lot of time. Um, if you are in a position to help us keep education programs I uh, like these webinars going, uh, especially during these uncertain times that seem to be just getting more uncertain. Uh, please support us at birdconservancy.org slash donate. Uh, your donations mean the world uh, to our whole team here at Bird Conservancy, um, and it allows us to keep spreading the word of, of birds. Uh, we are still offering very small in-person programs, uh, but with the current situation, always check our website um, and see if we are offering them. Uh, we'll, we will be back on Thursday, December 3rd at 11 a.m. Uh, for our next webinar, which is on grouse biology. Um, and that will actually be presented by Mar Marcella, who's one of our private lands wildlife biologists. Um, and she's based out in Gunnison. So she's going to tell us so many cool things about grouse. Uh, I know I don't know a lot about grouse, so I'm actually really excited uh, to attend that webinar and help out on that. So that's the end of the webinar. Uh, thank you so much. I hope you all stay healthy and happy and find some time to observe birds. Um, and if you have any questions, Stacy and I will, will, will stick around uh, for a little bit. Um, I saw the chat box was going off a lot. So Stacy, uh, did I miss any, any questions or, or anything else? No, actually, we, we got all of them pretty much. Someone did ask in the very beginning, what about our snowy owls? Yeah. Are they so, considered a winter bird? Yeah, I definitely... For the sake of time, I left out raptors, um, but hawks and falcons and our snowy owls and owls in general, uh, they tend to stick around in the same area. Most of them don't really migrate. Um, so snowy owls and owls in general can be seen in the high Arctic um, and they definitely, they survive the winter just like those small birds. Awesome, well, it's 12, a little bit past 12. So I just wanna say thank you all so much for, for joining us for this webinar. Uh, please check out our website or our Facebook uh, for future webinars. We're going to keep offering these uh, for the foreseeable future as that's the way education has, has become. Um, so again, thank you so much. If you have any feedback, feel free to give that to us. Uh, but enjoy, hopefully you have some sunny weather today. Uh, enjoy your day, stay healthy, um, and hopefully see you all in the future, either virtually or in person. <laughs>